Hey <laughs> guys, it's already O. Today we're going to do a really fantastic video. I've really been looking forward to this. Um, I want to have a look at one of those characters of history who really was at the centre of so much of what happened. I'm talking today about uh, a person who was at the centre of events that compiled through kind of the, the early 1060s and through to the roughly speaking 1065 or so. I'm talking today about Earl Godwin. Fascinating character, Earl Godwin. But let's take a little bit of a look under the myth and who was the real man. Earl Godwin, we don't know when he was born, but we know that uh, he died in April 1053 and became one of the most powerful earls in all of England. He rose to power under the Danish king's Canute and his father Sven. Canute made Godwin, an Earl of Wessex. Now, it's important to remember at this point that boundaries have changed. And so it's fairly clear that uh, when he said Earl of Wessex, that's not the Wessex boundaries that we see today. It's very, very interesting to have a scratch at the surface of, of Godwin's family and look at how he rose to power. Godwin's father was possibly, but we don't know, Wolfnoth um, Sid, who was then a thane of Sussex. We don't really know too much about this gentleman, but it, the name Sid normally refers to a man of rank. In 1009, Wolfnoth was accused of unknown crimes at the muster of Athelred the Unready when he mustered 20 or so ships. The ships were in fact then sent to pursue Godwin, but the ships were destroyed in a storm, or at least the majority of the ships were. Godwin was probably an adherent of Athelred's eldest son, Athel Stan. The Anglo-Saxons really love this name, Athel, don't they? Athelstan leaves Godwin an estate when he died in 1014. This estate in Compton, Sussex had once belonged to Godwin's father. So that's quite probably the estate. Although he is now uh, thought of as being connected with Wessex, Godwin was probably raised in Sussex, at least raised and therefore native of Sussex. When we think about how he rose to power, because at this stage, Godwin is really a junior noble and probably very young at this point. Uh, I think this is very interesting. You can only really speculate, but I think Godwin was a per person who saw the writing on the wall, if you get my meaning. Right, so in other words, Sven and now Canute were pushing in and taking over England. The Fjords had not succeeded in battle and the Vikings were reigning supreme. Here was a big problem. What do you do? Do you then go and fight a battle and die? Probably pointlessly. Or do you then take the advantage and, and simply change with evolution? We're in a state of constant change, and I think Godwin probably just accepted that. Some people see Godwin as being a traitor to, to the Anglo-Saxons. I don't. Uh, I think he was just simply a bit sensible and realised if he went and fought the, uh, the, the Vikings, the most likely outcome was going to be dying in vain. So why not 
join with him and try and promote Anglo-Saxon interests under a Viking king. Makes a lot of sense to me. Canute seizes the throne in 1016 and Godwin's rise was rapid. By 1018 he was an earl just a few years later. Now you have to think he was probably in his late teens or possibly early 20s at this point. By 1020 Godwin was Earl of All Wessex and between 1019 and 1023 he accompanied Canute on an expedition to Denmark where he distinguished himself and shortly afterwards married Githa, the sister of a Danish Earl, Ulf, who was married to Canute's sister. So we see this kind of intertwining of power. Canute probably recognised the fastest way for him to become successful and to achieve his ambitions was to utilise people such as Godwin who knew the Anglo-Saxon system, who understood the system and who knew the people. Someone like Godwin would be inherently valuable, amazingly valuable to someone like Canute. Canute's ambition was a North Sea Empire, a successful one. How was he going to get that? Well, he certainly wasn't going to get it by force because sooner or later not only are people going to resist but you're simply not going to get the outcomes that you're looking for. So to utilize someone like Godwin who would be able to speak to the people that mattered and find out what needs to happen in order for Canute's ambitions to be realized, I think that would have been very sensible. As a junior noble, Godwin would have been extremely well placed in Wessex especially. This was the seat of power of Anglo-Saxon England. So Godwin would have known all the people that mattered realistically, or at least the vast, vast, vast majority of them all. Not only clergy, but he would have known politicians, he would have known um, various thanes, he would have known uh, many of the Hiscals, he would have known uh, all sorts of traders and merchants that would have been coming and going. So for Canute, therefore, to establish himself and to realise his dreams, he needed someone like Godwin. And Godwin was the man. In 1035, Canute dies. His kingdoms were divided among three rival rulers. Harold Harefoot, Canute's illegitimate son, who seized the throne of England. Now we've already talked about that a bit in previous videos about uh, Edward the Confessor and so on. Half Canute. Canute's legitimate son, with Emma of Normandy, reigned in Denmark. But Scandinavia was under a lot of internal conflict. And Norway rebels under Magnus the Noble. In 1035, the throne of England was reportedly claimed by Alfred the Atheling, youngest son of Emma of Normandy, and Athelred the Unre Unready, and half-brother of half Canute. Godwin was reported to have captured Alfred himself or to have at least delivered him to Canute by pretending to be an ally. There's a lot of speculation here. Harold um, Harefoot obviously wants the throne and Alfred, that is the brother of Edward the Confessor, was blinded reportedly by hot pokers in the eye. I don't see that myself. Um, pardon the pun, it wasn't intentional. Um, but using acid to blind people had long, long been used as a practice. So why go to the extraordinary lengths of using a hot poker? According to contemporary manuscripts uh, of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Godwin had Athelred's retainers executed blinded, maimed, and scout. No more horrible deed was done in this country since the Danes came and made their peace here. Harold Harefoot dies in 1040 and Godwin supported the ascension of half-brother Halfcanute to the throne of England. When Halfcanute himself dies in 1042, Godwin supported the claim of Athelred's last surviving son, Edward the Confessor. Edward had spent most of his previous 30 years in Normandy, the vast majority of his life, 
His reign restored it. the native royal house. Uh, Edward the Confessor's reign restores the native royal house of Wessex to the throne of England because he was in fact related to uh, Alfred the Great. From Despite his alleged responsibility for the death of Edward the Confessor's brother Alfred, Godwin secured a marriage of his daughter Edith to Edward the Confessor in 1045. Edward drew advisers, nobles, priests and from his former place of refuge, that being Normandy, in a bid to develop his own power base. Godwin soon became a leader of uh, opposition to growing Norman influence. This is where uh, Robert de Jumini, who was uh, essentially the Archbishop at the time, recognised the rise and the potential uh, issues with the House of the Godwins. He then orchestrates, Robert de Jumini orchestrates a violent clash between the people of Dover, that is the Burgesses, i.e. The, um, the tenants of the town who were visiting and Eustace II, Count of Boulogne, Edward's father-in-law. Godwin was ordered to punish the people of Dover as he had done in the past in places like Worcestershire, Leofric, Earl of Mercia. This time, however, Godwin refuses, choosing to champion his own countrymen against a visiting foreign ruler uh, and his own king. Edward the Confessor saw this as a test of power and managed to enlist the support of Seward, Earl of Northumbria, and Earl Leofric, who was Earl of Mercia. Godwin and his sons were exiled from the kingdom in September 1051. Godwin and his wife Githa, his sons Spain, Tothdick, Gerth, then seek refuge in Flanders while his sons Leofrine and Harold fled to Dublin where they gained the shelter and help of the King of Leominster. They all returned to England the following year, about 10 months later, when the other earls, that is Leofric and Seward, had realised that if the King, as in King Edward the Confessor, could do this to one earl, he could do it to anybody else in the kingdom. Godwin then compels Edward the Confessor to restore his earldom. On April 15, 1053, Godwin dies suddenly after collapsing at a banquet in Winchester. According to one colourful account, which was written about 200 years later, Godwin tried to disclaim responsibility for Alfred the Aetheling's death. May this crust which I hold in my hand pass through my throat and leave me unharmed to show that I was guiltless of treason towards you and that I was innocent of your brother's death. Godwin apparently swallows the crust but it sticks in his throat and he dies of suffocation. However, this appears to be no more than pro Norman propaganda. Contemporary accounts indicate that he, Godwin had suffered some kind of sudden illness, possibly a stroke. By contemporary standards, Godwin would have been at least not a young man anymore. He would have been most likely in his uh, late 40s or at least early 50s, early to mid 50s. There is a, an account in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle under the year 1053 and it states, on Easter Monday, as he was sitting with the king at a meal, he suddenly sank towards the footstool beneath of breath of speech and deprived of strength. Then he was carried to the king's private room and they thought it was about to pass off, but it was not so. On the contrary, he continued like this without speech and strength right on to Thursday and then departed this life. Godwin's son Harold succeeded him as Earl of Wessex, an area then covering roughly the southernmost third of England, with the death of Earl Sibward and later Earl Athgard, the children of Godwin 
Poised to assume sole control, Tostig was helped into the earldom of Northumbria, thus controlling the north. The Mercian earl was sidelined, especially after Howard and Tostig broke the Welsh-Mercian alliance in 1063. Harold later succeeded Edward the Confessor and became King of England in his own right in 1066. At this point, both Harold's, retaining, both Harold's remaining brothers in England were earls in their own right. Harold was himself king and in control of Wessex, and he married the sister of Earl Edwin of Mercia and Morcar, Earl of Northumbria, who had replaced Tostig. Tostig had obviously been banished. He'd gone to Flanders and then later on to uh, Norway and organised essentially an invasion of England in conjunction with Harold Hadrada. The Godwin's family looked set for, to inaugurate a royal dynasty, but instead Harold was overthrown and killed in the Norman conquest. There's really no real legacy for Earl Godwin. He was a great man, I believe. He was tactful, skillful. He was an obvious leader, he was um, a statesman and someone who could really get things done. He would have been invaluable to someone like Canute and helped Canute achieve his dream of the North Sea Empire. Very interesting person um, and sadly he wasn't able to see the fruition of what he had set out to achieve. Yes, he was ambitious, and yes, he was perhaps even ruthless to achieve that. It's very difficult to view history with modern eyes because we see history through veils of things like um, values and ethics and morals that just didn't apply a thousand years ago. Righto, guys. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe, and share. I'll catch you in my next video.